Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello empaths, today we're going to be talking about the shadow, that part of you that contains your repressed negative emotions and often chooses to stay in the dark. Shadow emotions include things like anger, fear, shame, guilt, embarrassment, and repressed sadness. And, you know, a lot of people might be listening to this and thinking, you know, Samantha and Denise, we don't want to listen to this. We don't want to talk about that negative stuff. But we think it's important, right, Denise? It is, because the only way you can heal from it and move forward is to shine a light on it or to pull that root out. And I think that's where so many of us are right now is enough is enough, line in the sand, I don't want to carry this anymore. And we've talked about this in many shows of a lot of us feel this need to do healing the ancestral lineage or ending cyclical patterns or it it's time. So I think this is a really poignant episode for all of us. Yeah, beautifully said. And I like that image of pulling it out by the root because you've got to get right to it. Now, Ollie Anderson says, your shadow is all of the things positive and negative that you've denied about yourself and hidden beneath the surface of the mask you forgot you're wearing. I love that definition. Oh my, yes. And he says, your shadow isn't a thing or even a place, but a relationship you have with certain parts of yourself that you've hidden. And by improving this relationship, you can improve your life. And this is something Denise and I strongly believe in, and this is what we want to talk about You know, we're so often told that our shadow emotions are negative and should be released, healed, fought against, or forgiven. We hear terms like free your shadow and face your shadow. But what we want to ask you to consider in this week's show is this. How would your life look if you befriended your shadow? Oh, see, that's that's a big step. That's a really big step. It's when you can look in the mirror and really be bluntly dead ass honest with yourself. Yes. And, and start to accept all the parts of yourself, even the not so good ones or quote unquote good ones. Cause we don't want to put judgment on them. Right. So the idea for this show came out because I, I wrote a story about trying to befriend my shadow in my, in my June newsletter, because I was, I was visiting my dad's burial place on the one year anniversary of his death. And, you know, longtime listeners know my, My parents are kind of, uh, I don't know, they have opinions and ideas about themselves. And so, of course, they picked this fancy mausoleum in this fancy cemetery. Did you know that there can be fancy cemeteries, Denise? (laughs) There can be fancy anything as far as the more and more I look around. It's just amazing. You can... Bring the bouge to whatever you want. <laughs> you really can. There are there are two fancy cemeteries in my town. And so when I tell people, they're like, oh, that's a good one. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> but it is it is a beautiful place. So they're they're they got a door in this mausoleum and and it's gorgeous. It's the whole building is framed with this Spanish moss draped over these oaks. It's it's absolutely beautiful. There's magnolia trees. I walk in. And I've got flowers so I can, you know, replace the flowers in my dad's vase. And he's, of course, the top drawer, the very, very top drawer of this very, very high ceiling. And so I got to get the little pole out and I got to get the flowers and bring the vase down. And and that's easy. But then I put the new flowers in and I stick it in the little extension pole and I can't get it back in the vase. It keeps falling out over and over and over. And you know, Denise, all I wanted to do, I have my little tissues in my purse. All I wanted to do was bring my dad some nice new flowers and sit with some memories and some sadness and some joy, just reflecting and being with him, right? Right. But instead, I'm fighting with this pole and I start like yelling at him literally in my head. Like, why do you have to be such a flipping snob? Why do you always have to have the best of the best? (laughs) Even in the mausoleum, you have to have the top drawer. And I'm just I am yelling and yelling and yelling. I finally get the flowers in. I get it in the top drawer. I sit down with a huff, you know, and I'm like, son of a bitch, this is not how I wanted this to go. Mm -hmm. So I just sat with, I had to sit with my anger. I had to just sit with that anger because no tears were coming. Nothing was coming except more anger. And I'm thinking about, you know, 
kind of how he's been an intellectual snob my whole life and how it's annoyed me. And, and I'm like, this is not what I want. And then I thought, no, 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 sit with the anger. The anger is good. And I realized when the tears eventually came that my anger was there to protect me from those tears. Right? Right. Because I remember when when he died, it was so embarrassing. I could not stop crying that whole week. And one of the things I'm still so shameful about at his funeral, my sister spoke, my mom spoke. I could not get up and speak for my father. And and you know, my sisters listen to this show. They they won't be hurt when I say my dad and I were incredibly close. Mm -hmm. I should have spoken. I couldn't. I was crying so much that like my my throat wouldn't work. And it really, really bothers me. And I think that my anger pops up in those moments to protect me from that nonstop well of grief and tears flowing out because it's overwhelming, right? No one wants to feel that. So I started looking at how our shadow side is really trying to protect us. And, and I started to think, okay, well, let's just look at that word shadow as a metaphor. Like, What do shadows do for us? Well, they give depth and dimension to the light. They help illuminate where the light is. I even research like when you're painting and drawing, what does a shadow do? And what I read is, is said, we are taught that shadows give depth to help create the illusion that a painting is real. So I just want everyone to think about that a moment. Shadows create the illusion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. This means that most of the stuff our shadow self is telling us is an illusion presenting itself as a very real thing. That's incredible when you look at it from that perspective, truly. Yeah. It's all fake. It's all an illusion, and it's designed to help protect us. It's created when we're more focused on the persona that we're presenting to the world instead of the whole person that we truly are inside and outside. So there's Okay, I'm going to sound like my dad here, but I do want you guys to hear this very intellectual quote from Carl Jung that I do think describes it well. The persona is the mask we wear in relation to the world and others. It is created through a combination of socialization, societal expectations, one's experience of the world, and the natural attributes and tendencies of the individual. It combines elements of how we want to see ourselves ideally and how we want the world to see us, as well as how the world does see us and wants us to be. Our persona defines our social identity. It is constructed in relation to the roles we play in our lives and in our world, how we want to look and be seen. It's the face we wear to be presentable and acceptable to our society, but it is not necessarily who we really are but who we want and pretend to be to others and many times to ourselves. Oh, yeah, that's the persona. So it's really important to start to look at things that you do and say outside of yourself, right? Like kind of be an observer of you and start to look at how you go throughout life, how you interact with people. Is that really who you are? So I think the first step in identifying and befriending our shadow is simply acknowledging that it's there. Look at your triggers. Look at the things that make you angry or sad, the words people say or the thoughts you think that, that make you feel like you're hiding from the world or raging at it. Young said everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious the blacker and denser it is. So what that means is the less you are aware of it, the more you deny it. And like, I don't have a shadow. I'm fine. Everything's great. The more it's going to control your life and your choices without you even being consciously aware of it. And I think that often it may manifest in potentially addictive behaviors of overeating, overindulging in, in different substances to numb it out or even, you know, exercising to the point of, I think that sometimes it's so painful or it's so deep or it's so hidden that we may not even realize on a, an intellectual level that the behaviors are connected with that hidden persona. Yes, exactly. Which is why just being an observer for a long time, journaling, meditating is going to be really, really helpful. 
And what you have to do is look at these shadowy emotions without judgment, which is not easy. You know, none of this is easy, but it is important. Simply allow yourself to observe them and recognize them. Okay, so I'm going to be vulnerable here a minute, okay? I'm going to share mm -hmm. one of my shadows. One of my shadows is an aspect of myself that I call know-it-all Sam. Have you met <laughs> know-it-all Sam today? I haven't, but I'm interested in meeting her. <laughs> oh, I think you've met know-it-all Sam. <laughs> I feel like I just have to know things, right? I'm not I'm not saying I'm a know-it-all. Oh, okay. Right? Right. right. But when I when I'm completely uneducated on a topic, it it really bugs me. So I started to just sit with this and ask myself like, okay, where did you come from, know-it-all Sam? When were you born? Like why did I create you? And I started remembering all these little snippets from my childhood. Random little things. Like for example, when I was a kid, my dad and I were watching The Great Escape. It's one of my all-time favorite movies based on a true story about these uh, American POWs who are trying to escape from a German camp in Poland by digging tunnels. I was horrified at what these men endured. And, and I said something like, gosh, those Germans were awful, huh, Dad? And, and I remember he said, well, we did the same thing to the Japanese here in America. And he told me about the internment camps. Mm -hmm. now, I'd never heard of the internment camps. I was like in the fourth or fifth grade, right? We were doing our state history. So I, I said, oh my gosh, I never heard of that. And my dad got all popped up and you didn't know that? How could you not know that? I thought you liked history. What do you mean? You know, do you ever meet people yeah. like that? Yep. Okay. And so I was like, well, dad, because I'm nine years old. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Another time I remember he was going on and on about how amazing it is that England, this this tiny, rainy little island was able to be such a strong world leader for so long. And we're just sitting at the at the dinner table. And one of my sisters said, I didn't know England was an island. And we all laughed at her. Mm -hmm. And everyone was like, how could you not know England is an island? Go get a map. Someone get this girl a map. Ha, ha, ha. And you know, Denise, I still feel terrible about that memory because, okay, so what? She didn't know. But in, in my family, especially with my dad, if you didn't know something, you were laughed at, criticized, or belittled. Yeah. It was almost so, seen as a sign of weakness or less. Yes, exactly. And so I think it's it's really important if you have those shadow sides to to just sit with that little shadow, hold its hand, and just say, like, when were you created? Why did I create you? What are you protecting me from? And so me feeling this penchant to know so much is protecting me from feeling less than in the eyes of my father, right? Right when you were reading the quote earlier, I was thinking how deeply rooted some of these are is because when many of them were planted or started, we didn't have the cognitive, the social or the emotional capacity to, to know how to process it. And it's yes. just been sitting there for years or decades or, or our whole entire life. And now we're looking at that and everything you're describing is so spot on with what people are going through right now of old memories, old loop tapes, old things coming back and revisiting. So this is really, really important that I think that we're having this conversation today. Yeah, I do too. And, and you bring up a great, a great point in that when we created that persona or that shadow, it was with the knowledge and the needs we had at that time. And part of befriending the shadow is recognizing that you might not need that protection right now, right? Mm -hmm. you've, you've grown, you've gotten stronger, you've changed, you've healed. And so that's why I think it's so, so critical to take the time in your day, in your week, in your month to really reflect on this. And, you know, we think of these shadows as so negative, but some shadows are born not out of criticism that we received as a kid, but out of praise. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, I've got my dad wanting us to be super smart. The only time I received positive attention from my mom was when I looked pretty. So today, one of my shadows is this vain, annoying, preeny, little bougie ball of shadows, right? I, <laughs> it's true. I rarely, if ever, leave the house without makeup. I always try to look my best. And I do love it. You know, I do. I, you know that, Denise. You always mm -hmm. make fun of me. In, in a kind way, I make in fun of you. In a kind way. Yes, yeah, in a very, very kind <laughs> But I do think it's part of my shadow side if I really sit with it. Like, do you have to look your best every single day? No, mm -hmm. you don't. 
If you were the athlete in your family and received praise for like your prowess on the field, you might have a competitive shadow lurking in your subconscious. If you were the loyal do-gooder in your family, you may have a shadow that tells you to play small and focus on other people's needs first. So sometimes these shadows are created from the positive attention we got too. So it can get a little tricky trying to comp, you know, figure out which shadow is which. You have more than one. So start to acknowledge your shadow by looking at where you were praised in your life as a kid, where you were criticized in your childhood, and who did most of this praising or criticizing. If it's one of your parents, then think about this little nugget of truth. We tend to partner with someone who's most like the parent we had the biggest issue with. So until we heal this shadow, we tend to partner up with people who replicate the issues we had with our most difficult parent. So if you had a dismissive, cold, or abandoning parent, then until you befriend your shadow, you might be attracting romantic partners who are also dismissive, cold, or abandoning. And if that's not reason enough for healing and befriending the shadow, I don't I don't know what is. Do you? Right. Right. And that because it's familiar and that's what we were conditioned to believe a loving relationship was about. If the people that as a little person, you think these are the people who are supposed to love me and take care of me and nurture me. And that wasn't there. How would you know how to do it? Exactly. Exactly. So once you've identified your main shadows and have taken time to really think about where and when they were created, then you can start to shift your focus to ask your shadow this question, how are you protecting me? Now, the answer your shadow reveals will most likely not be true at all. Because remember, shadows are all about illusions. But the answer will reveal a lot. And then you can look at that answer and ask yourself, is this true? So, for example, years ago, I had a client who could not deal with any type of confrontation. Her voice would tighten, her hands would shake, and often she would simply start to cry. I asked her to think about where in her younger life she had felt silenced. And she shared that her dad was a rageaholic and her mom was always trying to keep the peace, which meant my client was told to be quiet all the time. The one time she did speak up for herself and her mom, her dad went tearing out of the house in a rage and got into a very bad car accident. He's fine, but her shadow kept telling her that when she speaks up for herself, bad things happen. Now, I just want to pause here for a minute, Denise, because I remember when we were talking about all of this, we were on the phone. I was doing some life coaching in the evenings back then. And I said, you know, we're asking her questions to get her to to, to find this this root, like you talked about in the beginning of the show, you know, like, like, where is this shadow of being unable to confront someone? Where is it rooted? And when she told this story about the one time she did speak up and her dad just was, he was kind of in shock and just raged and left the house and got into this accident. She had such a big aha moment. She had never put those two puzzle pieces together. Now you or I would go, how could you not? And yet I've done it in my own life. I'm sure you have too. Sometimes the most obvious things we can't see for ourselves. This is why I think talking to a therapist or a life coach or journaling or taking time to really observe yourself and and be alone with yourself and your thoughts to help you come to these realizations is so important. I agree. I agree. And, And then if you throw in the part of being highly sensitive, empathic, connected to other people's emotions, or you've had serious trauma or, or grief or loss at, at different points in your life, that could be a huge, huge place to start looking for uh, where the shadow might be hiding. Yes. Now, I find this also interesting. That client I just was mentioning, she collected toy mice. It was her thing. She had like knitted mice and crocheted mice and little Lego mice and stuffed animal mice. It was like her thing. She collected toy mice. Who's more small or meek than the little mouse? I mean, excluding Mighty Mouse, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) But sometimes you can look at things in your life that you're attracted to to give you a little clue as to your shadow. Now, once she recognized where her fear of confrontation was born and that her inability to deal with confrontation was really her shadow's way of protecting her from something bad happening, she was able to befriend this meek side of herself and work with it 
until eventually she started confronting her friend who was, you know, a bit of an energy vampire. And then she scheduled a meeting with her boss to talk about, you know, actually getting paid for her overtime hours. And slowly but surely, she learned to see that confronting people and setting boundaries and speaking her truth would protect her a whole lot more than keeping silent ever did. So see, when she asked her shadow, what are you protecting me from? The shadow said, I'm protecting you from bad things happening, like your dad getting into a car accident, and that was all your fault. Is any mm -hmm. of that true? No. But to that little girl, when that shadow was created, that was 100% true. Right. The other part to this of everything that you're saying is, if you confront your shadow, if you get really honest with yourself and you find that root and you pull it out, it takes away any option of being in a victim mentality. And sometimes it's safe to say the victim rather than stepping into your power. Yes, that is so true. And we can't do that. We've got to, we've got to take ownership for everything in our lives. Now, I'm going to take ownership for another shadow of mine because some of our shadows aren't so easy to hide. And longtime listeners know that I am a semi-reformed road rager. And while this isn't technically a shadow side, because other drivers, you know, definitely see this part of me when I beat my horn or glare at them as I pass them in the left lane, it is still not an aspect of myself that I'm proud of. So I started to befriend this inner road rager by first accepting that this was a part of me. Like first I just had to accept it. Like Samantha, this is who you are. You know, you learn to drive up north, <laughs> just deal with it. But mm -hmm. then I started to ask myself, what am I really mad about when I get stuck behind a slow driver? You know, like, like you said, again, Denise, getting to the root, getting to the root. And it hit me. I felt powerless. When I'm on a two lane road, stuck behind someone going 18 miles an hour on a 35 mile per hour road, there's not a darn thing I can do. I am not in control of the situation and I have no choice but to surrender to the slow driver. And once I recognized that this was at the core of my road rage, it just slipped away. I also helped this issue by making myself leave at least 10 minutes earlier than I normally would, so I wouldn't feel impatient and angry. That was my <laughs> comment on that, was that I was thinking about when I have been so annoyed with people, it's because I was behind schedule to start with and was really needed to get somewhere, or there's usually something else that leads up prior to. So true. But that feeling of powerlessness, I think that's rooted in childhood stuff too, right? Oh, I agree. And so I, I do think if you have a little bit of road rage in you, like, like I do, it can be connected to that. So our shadows are constantly trying to protect us. They're trying to shield us from feeling powerless, out of control, trapped, criticized, shamed, belittled. They really are trying to be our friends. The only problem is, well, first of all, they're not very good friends. And pr trying to protect us from these negative emotions they're actually trapping us in this false illusion of the persona or mask we present to the world. And the more we ignore these shadows, the more real their negative suggestions appear to be true. This is why we have to let them out into the light and see them for the gifts of truth and healing they're actually trying to offer us. Now, I just want to share a little quote. One of my favorite essays that I got to teach um, when I was teaching English was Stephen King's Why We Crave Horror Movies. Now, I know that sounds weird, but it's so beautifully written and he makes such great points. Really, this essay that he wrote is about the shadow. And so here's just a, a quote from that essay. He says, the potential lyncher is in almost all of us. And every now and then he has to be let loose to scream and roll around in the grass. Our emotions and fears form their own body and we recognize that it demands its own exercise to maintain proper muscle tone. Certain of these emotional muscles are accepted, even exalted in civilized society. They are, of course, the emotions that tend to maintain the status quo of civilization itself. Love, friendship, loyalty, kindness. These are all the emotions we applaud. When we exhibit these emotions, society showers us with positive reinforcement. We learn this even before we get out of diapers. When as children we hug our rotten little puke of a sister and give her a kiss, all the aunts and uncles smile and twit and cry, isn't he the sweetest little thing? But if we deliberately slam the rotten little puke of a sister's finger in the door, sanctions follow, anger from parents, aunts, and uncles. But these anti-civilization emotions do not go away. 
and they demand periodic exercise. The best horror films, like the best fairy tales, manage to be reactionary and revolutionary all at the same time. The horror movie has a dirty job to do. It deliberately appeals to all that is worst in us. It is morbidity unchained, our most base instincts let free, our nastiest fantasy realized, and it all happens fittingly enough in the dark. He says, for those reasons, good liberals often shy away from horror films. For myself, I like to see the most aggressive of them. Dawn of the Dead, for instance, as lifting a trap door in the civilized forebrain and throwing a basket of raw meat to the hungry alligators swimming around in that subterranean river beneath. Why bother? Because it keeps them from getting out, man. Keeps them down there and me up here. It was Lennon and McCartney who said, all you need is love. And I'd agree with that. As long as you keep the gators fed. (laughs) <laughs> isn't he a spectacular writer holy shit i mean uh, he's amazing yeah he's absolutely amazing but he's right i mean we have these anti-civilization emotions we do we have anger we have rage we have criticism judgment we, all of those they exist inside of us we live in a world of duality and we can't deny them we have to befriend them we have to feed them we have to let them out into the light And so you have to feed your gators in your subconscious with friendship, love, support, but also with reason and understanding. I think it's important to tell your shadow, I see you. Even as you try to hide in the dark recesses of my soul, I see you. I know why I created you, and I understand that you're trying to protect me. Come on out. Come on out into the light. Hold my hand. It will be okay. And together, we'll figure out this thing called life. Because as Jung said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. Which kind of goes back to your your comment, Denise, about, you know, not choosing the victim role, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think that that can be a default position, especially if, if that shadow is really powerful in your life. And we're not in any way, shape, or form negating how difficult this is. This isn't easy work. This isn't the more you can become comfortable with who you are and how you're wired and why you may repeat certain behaviors or tendencies or relationships, it it frees you to live more fully in the present. It really does. And a lot of people will say, I got so much feedback from that newsletter and people asked me to do a show on this and they asked me, you know, well, how do I befriend my shadow? How, how, how? And so, yeah, I, you know, I did some more research and I have read a lot of books on the shadow, but really, I think when it comes right down to it, it's just about examining your life, being honest with yourself and really looking at your motives and being truthful with why you work at this job, why you chose this partner, why you have these friends, why you constantly have this issue with work or money or health or relationships. How are all these positive and negative things in your life, how are they serving you? And I think if we don't take time in our day to really pause, reflect, and examine all of that, we're just going to be like a rolling stone rolling through life, you know, and who knows where we'll end up. But if but if we stop the trajectory of that rolling stone and, and we ha- hold that stone in our hand to continue my metaphor and really examine it and sit with it and reflect on it, then we can we can direct the course of our life in a much more conscious and proactive and positive way. That's beautifully said. And I'd, I'd like to add that if you do revisit a place in your life where you do find where that shadow started or the root or the whatever it may be for you, Please do it with gently that remember that you were, you might have not had the skills or you made different choices or you, so if you made a choice in your early 20s and you're looking back at it and saying, why did I ever do that? Or what was I thinking? Think about who you were at that time, not who you are now. Because I think sometimes we'll look at this work and we internalize it to the point of being you know, these are subjective words, but I was bad. I was wrong. I was selfish. I was this, I was that, but maybe it was just who you were at the time. Yes. And it was how you were protecting yourself at the time. Right. Right. But to, to let that own you or hold you hostage for the entire time you're here is, um, it seems like that might be one of the things that they make you come back and do another life for. Yes. Yep, yep, you missed that one. Get back in there. 
Get back in the game. <laughs> Put me in coach. <laughs> Okay, I want to end with a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. This is from one of the Gnostic texts that was found in uh, the 1940s. I love this quote. I, I read it. I think about it all the time. And this is when Jesus said, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And to me, that's the shadow work. That's the work of the shadow. You've got to bring it forth. You've got to confront it. You've got to befriend it. You've got to bring it into the light. And I just think it's so mystical and amazing and fascinating that these words were written thousands of years ago. I just want to add a caveat to that. It is. It's so spot on. Is that even if you do your shadow work, the people who may have been a part of that or who are in your life now may have a difficult time acknowledging that change in you. So may wait, <laughs> the English teacher in me needs to edit that word. They will have a difficult time. <laughs> Unless they've done their own shadow work. True. True. <laughs> Miracles can happen. People. Yes. This is work you can do for yourself. And it's not about, other people's reactions or judgment or thoughts, or they may see you differently or say, well, why all of a sudden aren't you doing it that way? That's their business. It's not yours. I'm so glad you said that, Denise, because you're right. And people might even say, well, it wasn't that bad, or it didn't happen that way, or you're so sensitive, or why are you, mm-hmm. why are you digging all that up now? Right. You know, focus on the present. You're so stuck in the past. You're going to hear all of that, most likely. But it's not about them. It's about you. It's about you and your healing. And everything in this world is an echo. You know, what we put out comes back to us. And so if you put out hope and healing and forgiveness for yourself, that's what's going to come back to you. And as Denise, as you always say, it's going to echo into the generational line as well. Yes. All that healing goes back as well as forward. And I believe that in my heart. Yeah, I I do too. I do too. Well, we hope this has been helpful to you. And we hope that it's given you guys something to think about as you as you go throughout this summer. Just take some time to really think about your your motivations, your expectations, your triggers, your little buttons that people can push. What are they? Why are they there? How are they protecting you? And and let us know. We'd love to hear what you think about this. And if you if you agree that it's important to befriend your shadow, and if any of you have done it and had great experiences. You can always email us, enlightenedempaths at gmail.com. As a reminder, if you want to check out some of our services and things we offer, you can go to my website, samanthafay.com, or Denise is at thegratefulmessenger.com. We hope you have a beautiful week. Please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.